This morning's sermon is the first in a series of four of a new sermon series. The title of the sermon series is Bible Stories That Make You Go Hmm. And so listen now for God's word to us from Genesis, the 22nd chapter, the first 18 verses. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled the donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. The two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, saying, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to hurt him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its thorns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said, called to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you and you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It had not been an easy life for Abraham and Sarah. At the point in which we enter into the story this morning, we find them in the winter of their lives. And like many of us, there have been plenty of times throughout their lives when they had struggled to believe in God's promises. Today's passage begins with the phrase, after these things, which things you may ask. Well, by this time in Abraham's story, Abraham has been in relationship with God for decades, and so many things had happened. First, God called Abraham to leave the only home he had ever known, to take his wife, to take his servants, to take his animals, and to set out for a place he'd never laid eyes on before. 
and Abraham obeyed. The very first test came when there was a famine in the land that God had shown him in the land of Canaan, and they had nothing to eat, and so they traveled to Egypt to get food. You might recall that this was one of two times when Abraham tried to pass his beautiful wife Sarah off as his sister. Sarah was taken into an Egyptian royal harem as a concubine both times and Abraham was protected as her brother. Now God never told Abraham to do this in the first place, but Abraham could not fully trust God at that point in his life, and so he took matters into his own hands. More than one time, God promised Abraham two things. He promised Abraham the blessing of land, and he promised Abraham the blessing of children, not just some children, but many children. He told him that he would be the father of nations. He told him that his children would be as numerous as the dust of the earth, as the stars in the sky, and the grains of sand on the seashore. Well, the promise of land was granted to Abraham in very short order, but the years of Sarah's barrenness put Abraham and Sarah's test to the faith. Faith to the test. I knew that didn't sound quite right. Abraham grew impatient, and so he hatched another plan. He decided that he would make Eliezer, who was his slave, his heir. But God said, no. And then after 11 more years passed, and there was no sign of a child, Sarah hatched her own plan. She told Abraham to take her maid, Hagar, as his wife. And so nine months later, Ishmael was born. Finally, when Ishmael was about 14 years old, God came to Abraham and he said, Abraham, now is the time for you and Sarah to have your own son. Well, by this time, Abraham was 99 years old and he laughed. Not only did he laugh, but scripture says he laughed so hard that he fell on his face. I could just imagine him rolling around on the ground. Well, Sarah wasn't much different. When she overheard the proclamation, she laughed too. But then, then it happened. Just as God had promised, Sarah miraculously conceived in her old age against all odds and gave birth to a healthy baby boy. And soon their lives were filled with laughter and they named their little boy Isaac, which means laughing boy. And he was their source of pure joy, the living, breathing sign of God's promise. But after Sarah gave birth to Isaac, she wanted Ishmael and Hagar out. She wanted them out of the picture and definitely out of the will. And so if we would have read the chapter that comes right before today's chapter, then we would have been reminded of the time when Abraham rose early in the morning before sunup. He took a skin of water and some bread and with a heavy heart, he gave them to Hagar and Ishmael and sent them out into the wilderness to fend for themselves. It would have broken him if it hadn't been for little Isaac, who greeted his father as Abraham returned to his tent. Isaac's smile lifted Abraham in a way that nothing else in the world could have done. Well, that brings us up to date with this morning's reading, which begins with the words, after these things. The phrase offers us a significant pause, a time to stop and reflect. Much like when you're reading a book and you get about to the middle and you've finished one chapter, instead of turning to the next chapter, you close the book, you set it down. You take a deep breath. Maybe you walk into the kitchen and you make yourself a cup of tea and you sip it and you reflect on everything 
that has gone before. And you just know that everything that has happened so far has been leading up to something bigger and maybe better after all these things. After all these things, God again tested Abraham. And this test, this test would be the greatest test of all. Now we've heard people talking of God testing human beings in a negative way. And in fact, I preached a sermon on that not too long ago. And if you were here when I preached it, then you know that I don't believe that God tests us in that way. I believe that Abraham's test was a whole different kind of test, more like a competency test given in school when to assess whether a child is ready to move from one grade into the next. Does he or she have what it takes to be successful at the next step? Well, given the history of how Abraham and Sarah had been unable to trust God's plan in the past, an argument could be made that God imposes this one-time horrific test on Abraham because God has risked everything on this man. God needs to know, is Abraham ready? Is he going to be faithful? For Abraham, the test is to see if he's ready to live into his God-given name. You may recall when we meet Abraham in scripture, his name is Abram, meaning high father or lofty father, and God changes his name. He says, your name will no longer be Abram, your name will be Abraham, which was significant because Abraham meant high and lofty father, but of all nations. Abraham is God's choice. Through he and Sarah, God has chosen to bless the whole world. There was a lot riding on this, a lot at stake. And so, after all of these things, God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Now Isaac was the apple of Abraham and Sarah's eyes. He was the child that they thought they never had, and they were much like parents who become parents later in life. They loved this child, and Scripture tells us that they were wealthy, very wealthy. They had the means to dote on this child, and I just imagine that they spoiled little Isaac. They gave him everything that he wanted. There wasn't anything withheld from him. But now Abraham found, finds himself in the midst of his worst nightmare. Lord, say it isn't so. Perhaps you have at one time or another said the same thing or something like it to the Lord. Oh no, not because the Lord has told you or anyone else in the history of the world to sacrifice a child, but perhaps there was a time when something happened that you never thought in a million years would happen to you or somebody that you love. Everything was riding on those last years, those last good years, he said, to round out my career, to travel, and to end on a high note. But then she got sick, and everything changed. Lord, say it isn't so. She had been working there for 30 years. She had been a faithful worker and received good reviews until the new boss came in. After about six months' time and trying to make a way, she knew that she had no other choice. She must go in and speak her mind and lay it on the line. She knew it was risky, and so she did. She was fired. Say it isn't so. After 20 years of marriage, she woke up one morning and he was gone with no forwarding address, leaving her with three teenagers to raise all by herself. Say it isn't so. The next day, Abraham saddled his donkey and with his men and his beloved son, Isaac, he set out as God commanded. And on the third day, Abraham came to the mountain and he told his men to stay behind and he and Isaac would go up to worship and then they would come back to them. 
Isaac carried the wood. Abraham carried the knife. Isaac had watched Abraham build altars all of his life for years, but this time was different. As they reached the summit, he said, Father, we have the fire, we have the wood, but where is the lamb? The next thing Abraham could remember, he's standing holding a knife over Isaac. Although he can't remember how, he has somehow bound him and laid him on the wood. How could God ask him to do this? He loves Isaac more than he loves his own life. And with his hands shaking and tears streaming down his face, he looks into the eyes of his beloved child and there he sees it. Trust and terror all at the same time. And in that horrifying moment, God speaks through an angel, Abraham, Abraham, do not harm the boy. I know now that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. And God provides a ram in a thicket in place of Isaac. Although we cannot relate to any sort of religion that would demand child sacrifice, Perhaps that is why the Lord God makes it clear in three prophetic places in the Old Testament that child sacrifice is forbidden. Child sacrifice, it is true, was prevalent in the culture surrounding Israel and also could have been, according to some scholars present in Israel itself, God makes it clear through the biblical witness that he does not demand past child sacrifice. As I shared with many of you, when after, shortly after I arrived here in the Dining with Dawn sessions, it took me about 20 years to come to grips with and to answer the call to go to seminary. One by one, God introduced me to people that overcame my objections and helped me to trust a little bit more God's leading. But I had one final objection, and it was the age of our daughters, who were five and three at the time. I shared my reservations with my pastor, and he suggested that I call a woman pastor in our presbytery, which I did, and we made an appointment to have lunch. Carol and I met together, and she's about 20 years older than I, and she, her children had grown and left the nest. And I shared my struggle with whether or not God was truly calling me to go to seminary. And God will take care of them. Well, I smiled and I looked at her politely and nodded my head. But inside of my head, I was saying, what, are you crazy? God gave me those two little girls because I'm their mother. I'm supposed to take care of them. Looking back, though, I know that her words were so true. God took care of them in ways that I couldn't have imagined. They had lots of friends through the seminary community and the neighborhood that God placed us in. The elementary school was one of the best. It turned out being just five minutes away. They got to enjoy and experience snow and sledding for the first time. They got to participate in worship and, and family worship in the seminary. Our little th three-year-old Kate, when she became four, walked up to the pulpit, placed her little stool there and climbed up it and read scripture better than her five-year-old sister. They both to start, started discovering their gifts. The story of the binding of Isaac makes a claim on all of us. All that we have, even our own lives and the lives of those that we love the most, that are most dear to us, belong ultimately to God, who gave them to us in the first place. This story is not a story about child sacrifice. It's a story about a man who, after living for over a hundred years and walking with God, finally reached the point where he was able to trust the Lord and because of that trust was willing to risk what was most precious to him, his son, Isaac. 
Now at the other end of the spectrum in the Bible, in the New Testament, we have the story of the rich young ruler. If you're comparing and contrasting, contrasting the two stories, you'll notice right away that Abraham was in the sunset of his life, and the scripture makes a point of saying that the ruler, the rich ruler, was young. Now, we don't know if this means that he was young in years, in chronological age, or he was young in his faith development, but there is this difference. And there's another difference, too. He comes and he says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, follow the commandments. And he looks at Jesus and says, I've followed the commandments my whole life. And Jesus says, okay, then take all that you have, all your possessions, and sell them and give the money to the poor. And we're told that the rich young ruler goes away sad because he had many possessions. At the point of the story where we encounter Abraham, this chapter, we see that Abraham has come to a place where he is able to totally trust God with that which is most precious to him. But at the point of the story where we pick up with the rich young ruler, we see that the rich young ruler is not able to trust God with what is most precious to him, his wealth. We don't know the rest of his story, but it's likely that just as God gave Abraham opportunity after opportunity after opportunity and gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to trust God did the same for the rich young ruler. Our faith is especially built when we are able to take one tiny step of trust in the Lord when the worst happens, when we are faced with situations, when the bottom falls out and we cry out, Lord, say it isn't so. Yes, Abraham's story is a story about a man who was finally able to put his trust, his full trust in God. But his story is our story too, because we aren't born knowing how to trust. It takes time. As we learn to trust, though, God draws us deeper and deeper into relationship, providing for us and blessing us so that we can do greater things for God than ever before. That's what happened to Abraham a few thousand years after Abraham walked the earth. After all of these things, when Abraham's descendants were more numerous than the dust on the earth, than the stars in the sky, than the grains of sand on the seashore, we see a similar scene it includes a mountain, but climbing up the mountain, it's not Isaac and Abraham anymore, it's Jesus. And he's carrying the wood. He would willingly sacrifice his own life. And this time, there's another difference. God would not stop it. God endured the pain of watching his beloved son die, of seeing Jesus' eyes filled with trust, and terror at the same time. This was God's gift to us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And in so doing, a new promise was made between God and humanity. This promise will never be broken. It is the promise and gift that we have through Jesus Christ, who is always bringing new life on this side of the grave and the next. God will provide, always has, always will. Trust the one who knows and loves you completely. And then just wait and see what God will do. Amen. Won't you pray with me? God, our provider, made known to us most fully in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You are perfect wisdom, patience, and love. Thank you for leading and guiding us into your paths, for we know that your plan for, plans for us are good, to give us a future with hope. 
Help us to grow in our faith, trusting you, especially in the times when the unthinkable happens and the bottom falls out. Remind us that you are there to catch us and to carry us through to better days. Thank you that you have chosen to partner with us in building your kingdom on earth. We pray for peace in your world. Let there be peace on earth. And let that peace start with each of us in our own relationships. Bless those who lead in our government. Give them wisdom, compassion, and a sure sense of justice. Be with those directly affected by the government shutdown. Comfort and protect those separated from loved ones, especially children separated from parents. We lift to you all those on the First Presbyterian Church prayer list asking for healing in mind, body, and spirit. We pray for those who grieve, including Sandy Davenport and her family in the loss of Bill. We pray for the children and staff at Lakewood Elementary and ask for your blessing on our ministry with them. We ask for healing and wholeness for seven-year-old Shanice as she moves to rehab and continues to recover after being hit by a car. We pray for the upcoming wedding of Megan Crowley and Dale Finneran, and we lift Marley Mathis David, great-granddaughter of Lillian Harris, asking for her continued healing. And now joining our voices together, we pray with the boldness of the beloved children of God, the prayer that Jesus taught as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God's word tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. The same word from which we derive cheerful is the same. We also derive the word hilarious. So with laughter and joy, let us return, I dare you, God's tithes and offer our gifts. And thank you very much to those who give online. 